My name is Henrik. Uh, I'm from University of Aarhus, so I'm a researcher, but I would say that primarily I'm a teacher, an educator, so uh, uh, I'm going to talk about my research field and what I teach most of the time, soft architecture, and of course it's about in energy efficiency, something about sustainability and saving the world and all that stuff. And then there's this subtitle for developers, uh, because uh, I focus my teaching very much on part-time education, which is uh, people from industry coming in to, to listen to me and do some exercises. And uh, what I like to, to teach is uh, techniques that actually do things in practice, you know? So uh, less mathematical rigor, but, you know, things you can pull down on the shelf and then actually make things happen. Okay, so, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with a small example. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot today about tactics or design decisions in order to make your software more energy efficient. And one of these is accept lower fidelity uh, or don't develop or use features that waste a lot of energy. So I'm going to, to take a concrete case of something we could imagine a system. You know, you have a conference session and then there's some speakers up here and then you want to ask a question. So how do we solve the problem of asking a question to the lecturer? We could develop an app. We could develop an app so I can take my mobile phone and spend some energy downloading this app. And then I could spend some energy running this app. And then I could spend some energy typing in my question on this app. And then I said send. And then we spend some energy on the wireless to send it to some access point, which spends some energy to make it to a server system. And then there's a server system spending some energy to receive that request, store it in the database. And then later, this good guy would spend some energy on his mobile phone to fetch all the data from the server. And then he would use his voice. Dear Henrik, there's a question here. So this is one solution. I would call it solution A. Okay, there's a solution B. It has works in the Stone Age. The only energy it uses is rye bread energy. You just wave your hand and say, Henrik, could you please? Okay, so I think this is what energy efficiency is about, and this is one of the tactics. <laughs> Avoid feature creep. Okay? Or... Avoid bull, sorry. Uh, uh, accept the law of fidelity and then uh, take the, the lesser road, the most energy efficient road of solving this problem. Okay, so now the stage is sort of set, you know. So actually, I discussed with Bettina that uh, I, I've been working in this half a year, and then she corrected me, about a year. Uh, so, so I started out as a novice in energy efficiency a year ago, and now I'm not quite a novice anymore. But uh, we actually started out with some companies coming to us and say, we need to talk about sustainability and eco footprint and stuff like that. And then I looked into it and I thought, oh, wow, this is a big topic. And I'm just a software architecture. I'm very much into coding. So how do I attack this? But it's a big topic. And uh, if you didn't see the, the presentation uh, last Monday, uh, go see it on, on the YouTube channels or whatever. It's, it's, it's very nice. I limit it very much to what I call in energy efficiency. So basically, the idea is that we need to supply some service to the user, and we can do that in architecture A. And when uh, we use architecture A, it spends some energy, and architecture B, rewritten the code in another way, then it spends another amount of energy. And energy efficiency is basically choose the one that gets the job done with the least energy. I just made an example of asking questions. But again, you, it's basically that's what is out. How do I get my computer to do as much as possible for every watt of power that we consume? Okay. I'm originally a physicist, so <laughs> I've been doing computers a long time, and that's bits and flipping, and then, and finally I found myself in my old turf, you know. We're doing measurements, 
I'm measuring real stuff that happens in the physical world, and I think that's really great. And one thing that really makes me happy is that uh, in order for you guys to become better programmers at doing energy efficient architecture and design, you have to understand the physics. So that's nice. But, but physics, you know, energy is basically amount of work measured in joules, and joule is a rather small scale, so if I eat 100 grams of my favorite mayonnaise, it's about 3 million joules, okay? And I know that because it takes me about 35 minutes of sweaty bicycling to burn the, the same amount of, of, of joules. We talk a lot about uh, electricity, and uh, we, there we often see how many joules do we use per second, and that's a what. So basically, uh, it's, a, it's a, the flow of energy we measure when we measure watts. And of course, you can then uh, say, if I use 1,000 uh, joules in one hour, then I got a kilowatt hour, and you can just do the calculations. But basically, it's the same, same thing. Motivating example. How many of you have seen Gangnam Style? Okay. You're bad guys. <laughs> no, but uh, I found this wonderful paper who, who found the data, and it was shown uh, 1.7 uh, billion times the first year, and then they dug into the YouTube and how much energy is spent on, on uh, streaming one YouTube video, and then you multiply that too, and then I found that the average yearly energy, electricity energy consumption by a Danish household, a parcelhus, and then I found that the, the energy is spent streaming Gangnam Style is about 70,000 Danish houses yearly electricity consumption. And then I was thinking, is there morale here? I, I hinted perhaps, I said you are bad guys, but you know, I don't think there's a morale here, but, but it's at least thought provoking. Right? Well, what are we spending our energy on? And and I don't think we shouldn't look Gangnam style or YouTube videos and stuff like that. There's some wonderful stuff out there, but perhaps we should try to lower energy uh, consumption. So if it's only thirty thousand houses, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, but interesting, I think. So energy is work done. Uh, hardware spends energy. Why does it spend energy? It's because our software wants, uh, of software uh, is running on it. And why do we write software? That's because uh, the boss told us to. Oh, you know, there's some users who are happy about the software we, we write. Hopefully, it is like that. So we, we have to make this relation between the hardware and the software. And it's very manifest when we're talking about writing code that's energy efficient. And there, let's start by the hardware. And I must say, the hardware guys, are there any hardware guys here? Sort of, you know, you're the good guys. Applause. You're doing a marvelous job. Okay? So this is basically a line that shows how much computation can you do for one kilo hour, uh, kilowatt hour uh, over time, you know, starting in, in the 50s. And it's amazing curve, so every two and a half years, you know, you can do twice as much computation for the same amount of energy. So that's really, really nice. It, it's slowing a bit now, but still, you know, good guys. You're doing a wonderful job. And then there, there are the guys who write the software. Any, anyone in here writing software? <laughs> you are the bad guys. <laughs> you are the bad guys. Because as Wyss said already in the 1990s, he said that software is getting slower more rapidly than the hardware has become faster. I just got this laptop last year, and then I'm a university guy, so the IT department did wonderful security stuff on it. Which means that when I boot it, it takes one minute to boot. Right? I have an Amiga 2000, it's from 1991. And in the boots, you know, I turn on the, boo, it's there. Okay, so, so much for progress. Uh, just a simple thing, I, I use virtual machines for my courses. I, I found this, uh, it should be the most raw Ubuntu you can find. So I found Lubuntu, anyone knows what the L is for? 
lightweight Ubuntu. So I choose the lightweight Ubuntu. In, in 16, it was about one gigabyte, and it ran nicely. Now, six years later, it's two and a half times, uh, and it can hardly run in four gigabytes RAM. Lightweight Ubuntu, right? And the, the fun thing is, it does absolutely nothing more than the old one did. So what the hell have we put in there? I don't know. And then there's Windows 98. Okay, so we have to look at what computers spend the energy on. I, I looked for data and I found this pretty old data for a gaming computer, but the basic idea is it, it's more or less the same. The numbers are changed a bit, but there's some consistency in this. So in the blue, blue lines, I've, I've taken the hard disks and the RAM modules, and they amount to about 18 watts. So what's, that's what they take from a computer. And then I... Uh, with the red boxes, I took whatever whatever happens, uh, which is related to the CPU. And first of all, the CPU spends an awful lot of energy. And what happens when an off in CPU is doing a lot of work? It gets hot. So what do we do? We have to cool it down. Okay. And what? How do you cool it down? You spend energy cooling it, right? Anyone been to a server room, you know, in the inside of the two racks, you know, it's really hot in there. Uh, so the, 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 the point here is that they're not the bad guys. It's the CPU we should look at. So basically, everything uh, that uh, is related to the CPU, you know, also hands the cooling. So, so all the energy is by basically going there. Then there's so, you know, networks, and if you have a device, the screen is the culprit and stuff like that. But I'm mostly in the ser developing server software. So, so these are, are the numbers I'm mostly interested in. But the, 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 the memory is cheap, basically. OK? So I made a lab. You know, I'm a physicist. I want to measure stuff. So I found this on the shelf. It's from 2012. And it's basically what I would call a secretary doing email kind of machine. And I made that the core of my lab. So I'm going to show a lot of numbers measuring from this one. I call it the lunchbox. You know, it's a very nice uh, little computer. And then I actually also found another. It was a high-end gaming computer. And I really felt good about installing headless Ubuntu on a high-end com gaming computer, you know. This poor graphics card is sitting there. No one wants to talk with me. Anyway, but, but that actually made the load. So I laid a lot of automatic load scripts that just hammered away on this small, small box. That box has, over the last half year, done more work than it has ever before in its full lifetime. It has been happy. <clears throat> if I measure the power consumption when it's doing nothing, it spends about... 11 watts, and if it's doing full throttle, it's about 43, uh, uh, 43 watts. So this is sort of my, my very humble lab uh, that I've done a lot of measurements on. And now you think, come on, Henrik, I'm deploying 100,000 services in the cloud, and you want me to listen to anything about a computer that size. You must be stupid. But, but the point is, a computer is a computer. It's a physical device, it's an electrical device, and CPUs are CPUs, and RAMs are RAMs. So, of course, you can't use my numbers I've measured them in. But the basic thing, this is not about the exact numbers, it's about the trends. So if the architecture A is 10% more efficient than architecture B, it might not be 10% more efficient in the cloud, but it's probably 8 or 15 or something. So the trend is what we are, we are aiming at here. What I measure on this one will scale to uh, the big systems. And if you found I'm wrong, please send me an email. <laughs> okay. I'm, okay, so how do we do it? <sighs> yeah, and again, one year uh, ago, I, I, I knew nothing, so I started looking. And this is my man, mind map after half the year of, you know, what I've come across. Uh, 
it's a big topic. There's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of papers. There's a lot of blog posts, and there's a lot of things. But I try to distill it down. So this has led to uh, yeah some of the main contributions, especially that one, is very nice. And it's all related to the paper, work in progress. You can find on this link, where I try to sum up everything I know, or the tactics, or the design principles I've found in some uh, some categories and some uh, some concrete advice that you can apply in your programming in your architecting in order to reduce energy consumption so please visit it and be and and come some comments i i would love that but let's let's talk about some it's divided into processes and more concrete what do i do at the keyboard so let's let's start with the processes how do we handle the process of developing uh, uh, architecture efficient software and the first thing is you need to measure you need to do experiments okay and first of all you need to experiment in order to find that architecture that saves energy compared to the other architectures that you have of course that and as i said you just uh, steal your computer from your mom <laughs> and 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 start uh, doing it there okay so it's important to do measurements, but it's also extremely important to get an understanding of what works and what not. I've had a lot of Eureka aha moments for the last half year doing measurements in there. I started out saying, well, I can probably save 5.5% uh, energy or 1% energy. No, it's 30% energy. Okay, and that was, whoa. <laughs> How did that happen? Okay, but uh, so so it's enorm enormously important to do the experiments in order to get a feeling of what what works. I think that's that's important, just as important as uh, actual measurements. How do you measure then? I bought this one. It costs 150 krona, and it's a power plug. You just plug it in, and then uh, your computer in the other end, and then you have a nice app where you can read. Okay, it spends uh, five watts at the moment. Okay, I, it it was great. I began to feel a bit bored because I had to look at my <laughs> phone all the time, which is, which is uh, not, not as scientific and accurate. But actually, in all modern CPUs since 2010 or something, it's built into the chip. So you just install PowerStat on Linux and then say, measure all the energy consumptions on a CPU for the next 24 minutes, and you get long tables of all the power consumption. And it's, it, it's only the CPU, so you don't get the fans and stuff like that, but they correlate. So it's much better to, to measure it directly on the, on the CPU. And if uh, pass that on Linux, and then you can use uh, Power Gadget, I think, uh, on Windows. But you need the raw machine, again. Find your mom's PC or something, uh, stale PC. Virtual machines, look at the cost, but this <laughs> uh, that probably correlates. Okay, measurements, it's physics. So uh, you need to control error sources. You need to do statistical measurements and stuff like that. That's, I, I could talk about that for an hour, but uh, read the paper. That's a really good paper about how to control that. So measure and experiments most vital. The other thing is, of course, prioritize where you're looking. You know, it costs uh, uh, mental resources and programming time to refactor your design to become more efficient. So of course, you should spend that on the the part of the code that's uh, handling 1,000 transactions per second, right? Not the one that runs every Tuesday night. Uh, quite obvious. And the other thing is uh, talk to your colleagues, talk to the architects, talk to the testers, talk to, to everybody and increase the awareness of this. Very simple example, this is my kitchen. There's uh, one bulb turned on and then there's another bulb turned on. And this one spends 40 watts and that 2 watts. So tell the kids which one to use, right? It's the same with coding, you know. Tell your colleagues what, what works and what not in order to increase that awareness of, often it's small, uh, small investments and then you get a lot of return. Okay, so we, uh, 
We're coming to the tactic session. What do we do when we sit at the keyboard? What do we do when we uh, draw nice diagrams at the blackboard and, and discuss? So I'm trying to unfold all these. So there's a lot of, lot of uh, different things you can do. I'm going through some of them. Um, uh, but they are under seven main categories, which we'll uh, walk about. But again, find all the, all the details uh, in the paper and please give me feedback uh, on all of them. So I'll go through some of them. And the fun thing is these, uh, each of these categories actually relate to something we could do at home and do at home, you know. So the first thing is shut down when idle. And it's the same thing as, God damn it, turn off the lights on the bathroom when you leave it, right? Okay, yell at that at the girlfriend or the boyfriend and, uh, and the kids, you know. So if an equipment is not used, turn it off, right? Uh, anyone doing microservices? Yeah. Anyone embarrassed that they're still on the monolith? Yeah, you know, microservices. Whoa, the great thing five years ago, 10 years ago, everybody should move there. And, and of course, it has a lot of promise because of that independent scaling, right? You have this web shop, you have all these browsing components, and when there's a lot of browsing, you have services that, but you only run three for sales because it's there's no sales. And then Christmas comes, and then you, ooh, you scale up on the sales component. And the good thing about it is that when there's no sales, again, you then can scale it down and then save a lot of energy. Uh, so it has a lot of promise. You can do uh, Kubernetes and uh, platform as a service, and they, they can do all marvelous things. But I, I did this talk a week ago in Copenhagen, and, and everybody got that. I asked how many do microservices and no one raised their hands and they had this pain, pain in their eyes because Ooh, I'm a monolith developer, I need to get grips with what's coming on and the young guys will take over my job and stuff like that. So a lot of fear, but then I showed them this slide. If you're not using that scaling, microservices spend a lot more energy Okay, so I did this simple thing. It's called Pizza Land. It's a pizza ordering system. There are two bounded contexts. One is an inventory system. The other one is an ordering system. And then I ran it both as a monolith, 20.3 millijoules per request, microservice 36.6 millijoules. So the microservice architecture, when not utilizing the scaling, is spending one time, 1.8 times as much energy. And all these monoliths, Developers, I said, yes, now I have an argument for my boss. <laughs> so keep, keep your monolith as long, and when the independent scaling is a necess necessity, then you should uh, move on there. Okay. Anyone going to a vacation, putting a lot of stuff in a suitcase, and when you come back, you find that all your socks are still there the same way that you placed it. Right? Yeah. Okay. So the same as software, don't pack a lot of stuff you're not using. And it goes for the, the Docker images, the deployment things. You know, there have been some very good talks about Grail AM here lately at the GoTo conference. And one of the promises is you only pack whatever software you actually need. So you, you don't transfer a lot of software you are not going to use. You don't spend a lot of energy unpacking it, etc. So try to, uh, try to minimize the payload of uh, your executable. Dog images, find the good base images in order to, uh, to get the minimal footprint. Of course, it same goes with network payloads, you know. Don't send a lot of stuff you're not going to, uh, not going to use. Buy a lot of stuff at the uh, at supermarket. In one go, you know, going to the supermarket, then driving back, and then found, ah, oh, we forgot milk, and then go to the supermarket and buy milk, and then you go back and, ah, oh, we forgot to buy bananas, you know? It's not efficient. Same thing about network traffic. And there's, an, well, a lot of different names for it, but uh, it's called batch method. 
uh, basically that transfer a lot of the information you need now and in the immediate future in one big bulk instead of doing a lot of uh, talking. I actually have an example from my uh, um, bachelor course. They're developing uh, a card game. Anyone playing Hearthstone? Oh, you should. It's a nice game. <laughs> but basically a card game, you know, okay? And I'm teaching object-oriented programming. A nice paradigm, but, but one of the things is that objects have a very fine-grained API. So here's a card interface. Get name, get mana cost, get attack, get health, get blah, 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 blah. Get, 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 get. And in order to draw this one, what do I need to call? All of them. Yeah? And if this is a remote call, get, 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 get. That was one card. Okay, get, 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 get. You get it. Right? That wasn't even intended. Okay, so. So. If we write that and use J, uh, Java MI or .NET remoting, you, you'd get all these chatty things. So actually, I teach my students using my own broker pattern, so I could rewrite, handwrite the code to do bulk fetching. So I bulk transfer all the attributes of the card and then store it for five seconds until doing another bulk transfer. Very simple. 27% energy is saved. That's quite a lot. And that's only on the server side. I only measure the server side. The client side, I haven't measured, I must admit, but it's probably among the same amount of uh, savings. And the network traffic, much less network traffic. So huge savings with doing a shopping list and then get a lot of data transferred in one go. <coughs> I'm, a, I'm a family, we do a lot of uh, cooking. And one thing I really hate is this fantastic Thai dish, and then we run out of soy sauce or ginger root or something. So we have another store besides the kitchen where there's a lot of things pile up, so we can just pull it from there. We are never out of Hellman's mayonnaise. We buy a lot of stuff and put them there. <laughs> okay? So basically, in computing, it's called caching. Okay? Get the data closer to me so I don't have to go a long way in order to to fetch the data. The example I just had before is an example of caching. Okay, get the card data here, and then I just use that from local memory for a long time. Content delivery networks is basically the same thing, which saves a lot of, uh, lot of energy. Okay. We should use efficient technology. In 2012, we were all ordered by the EU to throw out the old bulbs and, and use LED bulbs, and, and that, that's fine. So, of course, we can save a lot of energy. In 2017, there was a fantastic study by some Portuguese guys, and it was also referred to in, in the Monday slides, which tried to run benchmark in a lot of different languages, and then they compared the energy efficiency, C being the baseline. Okay, how many of you are C programmers? Awesome. How many are Python programmers? Some, okay. You know, Python didn't score well, well uh, but I was a bit concerned because, you know, what were the benchmarks? It was computing the Mandelbrot set. Anyone knows what the Mandelbrot set is? Okay. How many of your companies make a living by computing Mandelbrot sets? It's, it's basically a fractal graph, you know. We don't sell that stuff, you know. We don't sell end-body simulations or uh, uh, DNA sequencing or something, or fugue, but anyway, so I think I'm trying to do a more realistic one. So again, I took my three endpoint REST service and developed it. I had the Java implementation, I'm a Java programmer. And then I tried, to, I learned Go <laughs> in order to do this. But Go, well, 3.5% saved on the same service, right? Then my kid is learning Scala, okay? So I thought, I, I better also learn Scala. Plus 27%, okay? And then I did Python. And the first thing I noticed was Python couldn't cope with the load that these handle easily. So I had to recompute the amount of energy to per transaction in order to get this number because they did seven 
700 transactions per second, and this could barely uh, handle 1,400 transactions. But still, you know, 162% more energy on doing exactly the same. So next year we meet, I see no hands on Python programmers, right? One thing I'm also very happy about is I was really fearful that I had to learn C again or go, but you know, it's okay, you know. And I think because the virtual machine developers has tuning this machine for ages and the Python guys, interpreter developers, you're going to do the same thing, right? To save this environment and stuff like that. Okay, use efficient databases. Anyone doing SQL databases? And the rest are lying. <laughs> okay, uh, no SQL databases, anyone? Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but again, I mean, you know, SQL databases are awesome creatures. They can do queries and stuff like that. But if you don't only just store things in them and then retrieve the same thing, you're basically just a key value store that you're using the SQL database for. And there are much more efficient implementations of that. So I, I, again, I did my REST endpoint, three endpoint thing, and it was a baseline with uh, MongoDB, uh, uh, no SQL database, but with a pretty good query language, and then I changed to Redis and saved 31% energy on that one. Again, 31%? That's good. It's good. And I was thinking, you know, 2%, no, 31%. So again, Consider what your database should do, and then pick the one who spends the least energy. Okay. One thing that's extremely important to know about is the non-proportionality of energy consumption. And that basically means a computer that's doing absolutely nothing may spend 100 watts, and when it's doing full power, as much as is possible can, CPU at 100%, we're running 200 watts. And what does that mean? That means that we should, it, it spends an awful lot of energy doing nothing, so we, it should do something, right? Here are the same graphs from, uh, this one is for this little guy. The red line is the wall outlet power. And the blue line is when I measure on the chip, and the first thing, which is nice, they correlate. So the trend is the same. That's nice. Uh, this is for a more common server machine. It's an Xeon processor. And then you see that the, actually the, it's 60% doing nothing and about 90% doing a lot of stuff. You know? So there's less uh, potential difference when it comes to server machines. I think it's because they're built to be doing a lot. But what does that mean? That means that I have a single server. Let's say at 100 CPU, it can handle 2,000 transactions per second. Right? That's the maximum it can, can handle. And we can go in here, see it's running 100 CPU. That's 90 watts. Okay? Get me. 90 watts to handle 2,000 transactions per second. Now we do horizontal scaling. Wow, load balancing stuff. So what do we do? Now we handle the 2,000 transactions by giving 1,000 transactions to one machine and 1,000 to the other machine. And then we go in and say, what does it spend here? 75 watts. So exactly the sound, same amount of work is now spending 150 watts instead of 90 watts. Of course, you also have to run a load balancer. <laughs> so we can put that on top of the energy budget here. Yeah? Okay. The morale, the same thing as my wife does when she bakes buns. Bake a lot of buns in one big chunk. So we use our uh, CPU slash oven as efficiently as possible. How many of you have on-premise? Data centers, a few. W what are the, do you know the average CPU load on your servers? No idea. And, and what's the point on-premise? 
actually cloud providers are much better. They're running in the region of 60, 70 percent load on their computers, so it's it's okay. On-premise typically runs 15 to 20 percent load. And why is that? Because you know that if your server crashes, then the boss will be yelling at you the next two months. So you say, ah, I better make sure I double the energy and then or double the amount of servers. And I put a bit on top, so I'm completely sure that the boss won't yell at me. But it's a bad strategy, energy-wise. You should run your CPUs at 100%. Oh, a bit low. Okay, have some time. Bad. Okay, bad, bad. You can run your CPU 100% load if you do batch processing. How many of you do batch processing? Ah, actually, go back and uh, make a hundred percent. Okay, if you do server systems which are interactive, which are responding to things coming from the outsider, you know, social media, net banking, uh, banking, and all these, you know, transactional web shops and stuff like that, and you don't know what the load on your machines are, it's governed by Q theory. And the basic idea: you should not run your Q systems on. Uh, 100%, you should try to find that knee. If you don't know what queue theory is, has anyone been stuck in a queue at the highway in the rush hours? Yeah. Have you tried to run the same distance to an eye, two o'clock in the night? You know what queue th theory is. Random events, make sure that the waiting time, response time is extremely long when the, there's crowded, you know? So you have to run down at 70% on your server systems. But no lower, please. Pool physical machines use cloud computing uh, in order to group a lot of virtual machines on the same thing so we can drive CPU load up. Pool things use thread poles, connection poles. I tried to rewrite the same simple system that had a MariaDB storage using a naive thing. You know, I have a request, I'll make a connector to the SQL database, I'll do the SQL query, and then I'll turn off the connection. And then I tried using a, a thread pool, or sorry, a, a connection pool. Again, almost 30% energy saved by not having to make a connection and then tear it down again, and all that memory stuff going on. <coughs> Lower fidelity means make our users used to that it's not quite as polished, you know? One thing you know, your images and videos, downscale them. It's much easier to transfer uh, if, if an image if it's uh, at a lower quality, you know? So, of, of course, I know we get a less fantastic experience, but uh, we save a lot of energy, and we have to train our users and ourselves to make that trade-off in, our, in our, our systems. Server system, anyone doing locking? Yeah. Anyone who have a fear that we perhaps lock a bit too much? Yeah. You know, you young guys, you know, you come in, whoa, happy, we don't do any locks, and then it crashes, and the uh, boss yells at you for two months, and then you say, I'm going to do locking because I have to find out what's happening. And you do a lot of locks, and who removes those locks again, you know? Locking is expensive. I just turned locking off from, again, three endpoints, and what was the locking? It was only one lock message for each get and post request that say, I've been hit. Three locks in this, and then I turned it off and saved 11% of energy. And this was not Humio or an Elk stack or something. It was simply Docker writing stuff to the file system. 11%, 11.6%. I know this is a trade-off. Don't remove all your locks. You want to diagnose your system when it fails, but it's a big, big issue. And finally, feature creep. We already been around that. I love this word thing. And the question is, do I really need all that? It spends energy. And then we had the, you know, ask your questions on this one, okay? So uh, back to my little machine. I did this pizza land thing. Actually, it's the core of a 
a ordering system for pizzas. It handles uh, all the ordering. It handles all the inventory systems, so it decreases the stock of pancetta when we and blah, blah, blah. And one thing I, I noticed, this number and then I'm, This machine can handle over 50,000 orders per hour. How many of you know any pizza systems that handles 50,000 orders per hour? So the point is, even 10-year-old hardware can do an awful lot of stuff if we just code the core things that you should do instead of putting all that bells and whistles and shit around it. I know security will probably make that 5,000 orders per hour, but still, 5,000 orders per hour is still a lot, you know? So why do we need all the other things? It's because we put bullshit around it, sorry. Okay, I'm at the end, but basically, look at these techniques, learn, try it, find an old computer. Learn with it, measure it, get, get used to what, what works, what not. And is there any low-hanging fruits? Get that utilization up in your on-premise service centers, please. You have a world to save, right? Uh, and then start learning Go or C++ or Java, C Sharp, okay? One student actually mentioned ARM processors spend quite a lot less energy than Intel processors, so... Hmm? I haven't looked into that, but that's interesting. And finally, this old saying, perfection is achieved not when there's nothing more to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. So go to your bosses tomorrow, say, I want half a year's salary, but I promise you, I'll pull 100 features out of our system. Okay? Yeah, it's difficult to sell, I know that, but I think we should try to to work on, on that one.